Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Nice to see you all. Thank you for coming. I actually can say I know every single person in the room, which is unusual at the University of Chicago since I'm not from the University of Chicago. So thank you all so much for coming to the workshop entitled Secularism and the Citizen in the Middle East and South Asia. I'd like to first take the opportunity to thank the Mellon Islamic Studies Initiative at the Divinity School, and in particular the steering committee of Professor Sells, Professor Donner, Professor Kutbuddin, and Professor Nirenberg, who graciously invited me to spend a quarter here at the University of Chicago. I'd also like to especially thank Nora Jacobson, uh, ben Hamad, who's put in countless hours, although I hope she's counting, and done so much to make my time here productive and enjoyable, not to mention managing the entire workshop. So thank you very much, Nora. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here today and at the University of Chicago. When I was asked to organize a conference for my stay here, I decided to take the opportunity to invite those scholars whose work has been so influential to my own, partly as a tribute to their scholarship partly to have an opportunity to talk with them after only reading them from afar, as it were, but also to share their seminal contributions with students here at the university. Each one of these scholars has paved the way in their own fields, <clears throat> and I'm delighted that they have agreed to share a couple of days with us here at the University of Chicago. So the workshop has been organized in conjunction with the seminar I'm currently teaching, where we read these and other scholars' work on theorizing secularism, but also more fundamentally in grappling with a very complex and theoretically challenging field of religion in some of its various manifestations. The workshop was designed specially for my students, in particular as a way of facilitating conversation with the very distinguished scholars whose work they've been engaging with in class and employing to great benefit in their own research. We have here a range of disciplines represented from political science to anthropology, sociology, and European intellectual history, which I think nicely captures the increasingly disciplinary cross-fertilization in academe, but also the necessarily multifaceted approach to the study of religion. So I do appreciate the symbolic significance of hosting this particular event here at the Divinity School. As this is also likely to be my last opportunity to hold the floor, I'd like to formally thank Holly Schisler, whose idea it was to invite me here. We finally, after so many years of talking about it, actually embarked on a joint research adventure. And also to Aisha Polat, PhD candidate at the Divinity School for sharing so much of her valuable time, and yes, when you're writing your thesis, every minute is valuable, helping me to learn Ottoman. Nobody ever accused the faculty and students of the UFC of not being productive, especially in the winter term. So in terms of logistics, we've devoted a full hour to each speaker with the expectation that the speaker will present for approximately 30, 35 minutes leaving plenty of time for questions, discussion, and conversation. We've also made sure to punctuate the workshop with very civilized coffee and lunch breaks to allow us as much time as possible for more informal chances to engage with the speakers and, of course, with each other. As a special note of appreciation for our guests, one of the students from the seminar will introduce each speaker. And I am, unfortunately, the bearer of the Bad news that uh, Professor Bayat will not be able to join the workshop after all, as, as he and we intended. So as MCs are wont to say, without further ado, I'll pass the mantle over to Gwendolyn Bellinger, MA student in Middle East Studies in the Social Sciences Division here at the university, who will introduce Dr. Hepper. Okay. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Hepper, who is visiting Chicago today from <coughs> Turkey and has kindly agreed to present his talk titled, Some Notes on Secularism in Turkey. 
Dr. Hepper received his PhD from Syracuse University in New York and has had numerous fellowships and professorships at many major universities in Turkey, the United States, Israel, and the United Kingdom. He currently serves as a professor in the Department of Political Science at Belkent University in Ankara, as well as provost in the Office of Vice Rector in academic, for Academic Affairs and Director in the Center of Turkish Politics and History. He is also a founding and honorary member of the Turkish Academy of Sciences. His enormous contribution to the field of secularism and Islam in Turkey is illustrated in the wealth of his published articles, including such work as The State, Religion, and Pluralism, The Turkish Case and Comparative Perspective, The Victory of the Justice and Development Party in Turkey, and The Conservative Democratic Government by Pious People, The Justice and Development Party in Turkey. In his most recent work, Does Secularism in Turkey Face a Real Threat, Dr. Hepper explores the success and the cognitive revolution instigated by the founders of the Turkish Republic and argues that Turkish people, religious and non-religious alike, have developed a strong loyalty to the secular republic. He suggests that those who identify as pious voluntarily separate religion and politics, um, and therefore their loyalties to the secular state do not contradict their religiosity. And so without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Hepper. It's my <clears throat> pleasure and privilege to be at Chicago University. I used to come to Chicago so very often uh, in the past, so uh, I'm here again. I like this hall. It's like uh, <clears throat> I feel like I'm in Oxford or Cambridge. <laughs> uh, the uh, the title of the presentation. Uh, I had shared with the uh, uh, organizers of this conference was some notes on secularism in Turkey. In the process, I changed it to some preliminary notes <laughs> on secularism and uh, secularism in Turkey. I have been asked by a UK publisher uh, some years ago to write a book entitled uh, Secularism, Islam, and democracy in Turkey. And I said, I can do it very easily, no problem. You know, so many people have written on this. I have made some uh, contributions myself. And then, uh, uh, you know, I would come up with a grand summary of all this, and the uh, uh, publisher would be very much pleased about it. But then, uh, you know, I started to, th to think that the, uh, if I do that, I would not really be making any contribution at all. You know, I would be just repeating what others have written, what I've written. And some people may be uh, familiar with it, like her. So, you know, she would ask, so these people ask the question, why I have written a book? But as I was thinking about it, uh, <clears throat> one day, in fact, I was shaving one morning, <laughs> Uh, then I thought, well, there is this uh, polarization in Turkey uh, between the uh, what I call radical secularists on the one hand and the uh, pious uh, on the other. There are two other groups. There are moderate secularists in Turkey and also uh, uh, Islamists. Uh, but there is a, uh, this great debate between the radical secularists and the, uh, and the pious. So much so uh, that the members from these two groups just cannot got, get together and uh, be engaged in a meaningful debate. It has become almost impossible uh, for them uh, to carry out uh, sort of a dialogical debate. They don't listen to each other. They don't want to learn anything from each other. Uh, so uh, my question is, uh, how have we come <coughs> to, this, uh, to this point? And of course, uh, it wasn't really like this before 2002, before the Justice and Development Party uh, came to, to office. Uh, the uh, 
radical secularists, of course, are arguing that the, uh, the present government in Turkey, the government in Turkey since 2002, the Justice and Development Party government and its leaders eventually will bring back a state based on Islam. Uh, whereas uh, those leaders and the Justice and Development Party argue that uh, the members of that political party and those leaders are really practicing Muslims, but they prefer uh, secular uh, politics. Uh, and I think there is a truth in this. You know, the Justice and Development Party governments have been in office for quite some time. Um, they have not turned against the West. Uh, on the whole, you know, there are harmonious relations between Turkey and the United States, between Turkey and the United Kingdom, until recently even between Turkey and Israel. Uh, and the... Uh, uh, this political party have been obtaining more and more votes from 2002 to 2011. In 2002, their votes were 34 uh, percent. It, it went up to 46 percent in 2007, and then 2011 even 49.9 percent. Um, they must be honest when they say our, uh, you know, we are practicing Muslims, but we prefer secular politics. Then we look at the people who are giving their votes for them. Now, um, in Turkey, people are not voting, have not been voting for quite some time for political parties uh, just because uh, they are religiously uh, oriented uh, political parties. When you ask people whether or not you know, they would be receptive uh, to a state based on Islam, based on Sharia, uh, more than 80% of them say no. When you look at the remaining 20%, uh, only 9% of them uh, would uh, support men marrying more than one woman. And when you ask them, uh, you know, a, if, if a woman has been engaged in adultery, uh, should that woman be should that woman be uh, published according to uh, Islamic rules? That percentage even drops to two percent. Uh, so it's not it's not surprising though that they are not really voting for justice and development part just because it, it is a uh, religiously oriented uh, political party. Since 2002, for instance, we have two religiously oriented political parties uh, in Turkey, the so-called Felicity Party and the Justice and Development Party. Felicity Party introduces itself as a, uh, a religiously oriented political party whereas the Justice and Development Party considers itself as a conservative democratic. And the Felicity Party has been obtaining votes in those t three elections uh, no higher than 3%. Uh, to what extent people uh, are tolerant toward each other when it comes to practicing uh, their religion? Uh, Again, some reliable nationwide surveys uh, indicate that there is a great deal of tolerance on this matter. For instance, uh, if you ask people the following question, uh, <clears throat> if, if a person <clears throat> believes in, in God or Allah, in, his, uh, in Islam's case, and his prophet, would you still consider that person a Muslim? If that person, for instance, does not practice his or her religion, does not go on the pilgrimage, does not fast, 8 to 2, 83 percent of the people considers that that person is still a, a Muslim. Uh, so, uh, what I am uh, 
concluding uh, from all this and from some other findings that in Turkey, uh, one really cannot talk of a political Islam if political Islam is an Islam uh, that people would prefer if, if, peop if people want to have a state based on Islam. Uh, that's, that's political Islam as far as I'm concerned. But, the, you know, religions play different roles at, at different levels. You know, you may have religion playing a role at the level of the state. That's what I call political Islam. Religions may play a role at the level of the society or community. And religions may play, play a role only at the level of the individual. So uh, I, I therefore uh, make a distinction between piety uh, and Islamism. And I call people pious people who are Muslims, who practice their religion, who derive some virtues for them uh, from, from their religion but they don't insist that others should have the same conception of religion as they themselves. They should not insist that others should practice their religion as they do. And of course, they are not uh, after a state uh, based, uh, based on, uh, on Islam. And uh, it seems to me that the, most of the people uh, have this particular conception of Islam uh, in Turkey. Uh, so does the Justice and uh, Development Party and its, its leaders. But uh, we have uh, <clears throat> some secularists uh, in Turkey. Uh, <clears throat> they think <clears throat> uh, it is all takia, it is all simulation, that these people uh, may not show their true face, but uh, <clears throat> there is an ulterior motive here. They may. Uh, they may hide it, but whenever the time is ripe, they will try to bring uh, back to Turkey a state uh, based, based on Islam. Uh, now, as far as these people are concerned, you know, when you think about laicism, secularism, I think we need to make a distinction between laicism and secularism too. We, most of the time, we use them interchangeably. As far as I'm concerned, laicism is that the you know it's, it's a separation of state and religion. Secularism is something else. Uh, one a person is secular to the extent to which, according to my own definition and according to the definitions of some other people too, if that person. <clears throat> uses his reasoning faculties rather than turning to religion and to into religious personages when that person is going to make a, a decision. Now, when we think of uh, a portion of secularists in Turkey, uh, for them, laicism is uh, a worldview a philosophy of life. The Constitutional Court in Turkey made a number of rulings. And I shall now read uh, for you their conception of laicism. Now in Turkey too, laicism and secularism are interchangeably used. We have just one word in Turkey. It is laiklik. Some of us talk about secularism, but the, in the Constitution and as far as several people are concerned, it is laicism. Now, the Constitutional Court ruled, I quote, laicism is more than the separation of state and religion. Laicism is Turkey's philosophy of modernization. It is the last stage of the intellectual and organizational evolution of societies. If these are in danger, restrictions can be and should be brought to basic rights and liberties and to democracy. Our Council of State, uh, Conseil d'Etat in France, uh, also came up with such a definition of 
laicism, quote unquote. And I was president from 2000 to 2007, Ahmed Nejdet Cesar had a similar view. Now we know that the basic or major issue of contention between the radical secularists and the pious revolves around this headscarf issue, the covering. Now, the secularists I have in mind consider it as a political symbol. They think headscarf is an indication of belief in dogmas, superstitions, and uh, ignorance. Whereas the pious argue it's an obligation dictated by, by Islam. Some month, some month ago, or some years ago, I'm not quite sure, there was this, this girl on a bus with a headscarf, and he started to talk with her friend in English. All the passengers turned to him in great amazement. You know, a, 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 a person with a headscarf, how can he know, how can we talk uh, in English? So what's going on? Why we have uh, such a uh, conception of Islam, such a conception of uh, headscarf on the part of uh, some secularists in Turkey. Uh, it seems to me that uh, they have taken their cues from a particular approach of Atatürk back in the 1920s. Uh, Atatürk, the founder of Turkey, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, uh, had thought that the Westerners looked down upon the Turks because of their clothing patterns. So he wanted to change all that. Uh, you know, he wanted Turkish women and Turkish men to dress themselves as the Westerners do. Consequently, for instance, some women in the early republic competed in some athletic events in shorts, or uh, you know, they had swimwear on the beaches, the modern swimwear on the beaches, and, and then they considered themselves as Ataturkists, as Westerners. So uh, to begin with, uh, the outer appearance of people uh, became rather significant in the eyes of many people. Atatürk and his colleagues uh, had set for Turkey the goal of uh, catching up with the contemporary civilization. So they thought they had now become civilized because of this particular dress pattern. But Atatürk was trying to do something else, which particularly these secularists missed. Atatürk was not only placed an emphasis on the outer appearance, but also on what you might call a sense. Atatürk was trying to bring about, I think it has been just mentioned, a, a cognitive revolution. Some people think Atatürk was trying to bring a cultural revolution. In my opinion, it wasn't cultural, but cognitive revolution. Uh, Atatürk wanted secularism, as I have designed, uh, as I have defined it a, a moment ago, that, that the people should use their own reasoning faculties and not to turn to the book or the religious uh, personages. Um, so um, in, in my earlier work, I have pointed out that Atatürk was trying to instruct people in Turkey in how to think, not in what to do. In fact, Atatürk uh, several times pointed out that uh, whatever he was doing in the 1930s, 1920s, would not be applicable in, in the later uh, ages. As a consequence of which, uh, some, some secularists, in my opinion, started to place emphasis on the question of what should be. What should be is, of course, contemporary civilization. 
as they have understood it, rather than on what is and why. So I, I have arrived at the conclusion relatively recently that here we are face to face with a normative mindset at the expense of analytical and empirical mindsets. Thus, in Turkey, I have observed a tendency toward rationalism rather than rationality on the part of several educated people. The rationalism presumes innate knowledge. So I am civilized, therefore I know. Rather than, uh, whereas rationality is based, of course, on empirical observation and, and re reasoning. So, uh, these secularists have come to the conclusion that in modernizing Turkey, there should be no place really for religion because religion is nothing but dogmas and, and superstitions. It is of course because of this that it, had, it has become very difficult uh, to engage in dialogical debate between the radical secularists and the, uh, and the pious. So in, in, in more general terms, I think what I am saying is that in the West, empirical and analytical have shaped the normative, while in Turkey, normative left hardly any ground to the empirical and analytical. I thought this was a very original finding, conclusion on my part, but to my surprise, I have found out in my readings that in the late 1910s, an Ottoman great vizier, Said Halim Pasha, observed the following. He said, while in the West, now this is in the late 1910s, and Said Halim Pasha is a, a, a conservative a Pasha, he said, while in the West, mind moves from objects, read empirical reality, to thoughts. In Turkey, mind still moves from thought to objects. He then added, as a consequence, our aspirations are no more than illusions, which are very difficult to uh, realize. And then I, then, then I ask myself, why is this so? Well, uh, perhaps one explanation is that in the West, there took place an organic change, whereas in Turkey, it was an induced change. So the West changed by its own dynamics. West, you know, in the West, society is politics transformed by its own dynamics. In Turkey, there have been efforts to replace one society and polity by another society and polity. So the Turks were emulating the West. So as a result, I tend to conclude on this particular point that the Westernization in Turkey turned out to be a process of mimicry, which of course obviated the need for empirical investigation and analysis. Instead, it had develop a normative wine, uh, mindset. Whatever we have borrowed from Turkey, they are the best. You cannot have any argument on this. So it was not a selective uh, uh, adoption, as the Japanese had done, but a wholesale uh, uh, emulation and adoption of Western ways of doing things. Now, many of us think that in Turkey, we opted for total westernization. There was a uh, intellectual, again, in, in, in late 1910s, uh, Cevdet Pasha. I met Cevdet Pasha, if I'm not mistaken. 
uh, he said the, uh, we should westernize and we should adopt western ways uh, with its roses and thorns. And Atatürk was also, of course, for uh, total westernization. At the turn of the century, in the early 20th century, there were some, uh, some thinkers who thought, you know, we should uh, adopt the technology from the West, but not the culture. But for Atatürk and his colleagues, total westernization should have been the goal that Turkey uh, should have pursued. But when I think about this now, in terms of uh, what I have already told you, that total westernization was in fact a partial westernization. We have borrowed the outer appearance of things, not the essence. Borrowings included neither an appreciation of the facilitating conditions uh, why, why the West had industrialized so early as compared to Turkey, for instance, and some other countries. And we have not also, we have not also become very curious about the thinking patterns, mentalities behind those changes. And then, and then uh, I tend to argue this mim mimicry I have mentioned had also been facilitated by an educational system in the Ottoman Empire and to a great extent even today in Turkey where one memorized rather than learned uh, I can give you very interesting uh, examples, if you like, in the question and answer period. And consequently, we became, or some secularists, or some educated in general, uh, have become zealot defenders of the utopian, that is the ideal types of what was emulated. This was, of course, also being mentioned by Said Halim Pasha uh, in the 19, uh, late 1910s. Well, my conclusion here is uh, if we return to what we are investigating today, what we are supposed to investigate today and, and discuss, uh, my conclusion is that while in general the separation of state and religion has been favorable to the emergence of a liberal and democratic political system. In Turkey, laicism taken as state, as state-defined secularism has been an obstacle to the flourishing in that country of a liberal and democratic system. I better stop here so that we, we would have lots of time for questions and answers. on memorization in Ottoman and in modern Turkish education with the tendency to latch on to and defend utopian ideals? Well, you see, you think versus doing some things uh, and they are successful, so whatever they are doing is, is the right thing to do. So we should do the same thing. Uh, but in doing so, they are not, they are not really thinking, how come you know, the West came to have uh, such a civilization, such a political system, such an economy. Uh, and the, so we think that 
when you begin to write these things down in our constitution or someplace else, uh, we would have the same. So there is no analysis. We don't really uh, uh, pay any attention to really what happened in Turkey in, in the West and why. And, 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 and consequently, uh, we just never you think it, it, you don't learn because when you learn you think you see when you learn what happened and why when you memorize you don't you don't make that exercise you don't make that mental exercise that's what I'm trying to say um, so um, you talked about the radical secularists uh, the chemists that you actually have been studying for a long time. Um, I'm just wondering, in terms of the wide spectrum of um, levels of piety and secularism in Turkey, do you still consider chemist rigid secularism as the heart of political culture in Turkey, or um, do you also take um, different terminologies invented for more softer, more inclusive forms of secularism, like Ahmed Kuru would refer it as... That's sort of secularism. Uh, yeah, like the passive secularism. secularists or less authoritarian, because, I mean, Kemalists are, to me, a shrinking category. It's also a generational thing. It's harder to find hardcore Kemalists in the younger generations than the senior, like, uh, more senior generation, I think. I mean, I mean, you need to see that. <coughs> First of all, we have to make a distinction between Kemalism and Ataturkism. Again, in Turkey, we use these terms interchangeably. Uh, in my recent work, I've come to the conclusion that Kemalists are those who consider the early republic as a rather authoritarian in several ways and that therefore Turkey today still suffers uh, from that uh, particular heritage. Now, the Turkists are those uh, who approve what Atatürk has done. They don't criticize. Uh, they have a rather favorable approach to Atatürk and what he has done. But again, uh, those are those are the people uh, who still think we, you know, we can just repeat things. Whatever has been done in the early republic, uh, if you do the same things, you know, we would be the best of the Turkish, and also it would be in the best interest of the uh, of the country. Uh, the uh, uh, the, the group of seculars I'm referring to, of course, favor assertive secularism that Ahmed Kuru, in his work, uh, suggested this, this terminology assertive secularism and passive secularism. In assertive uh, secularism, you may have a laces system of government. The state is sort of separated from religion, but religion is not separated uh, from the state. So the state uh, would have control over religion, how religion is perceived, is a consequence of which, for instance, in Turkey we have set up this directorate of religious affairs, which is affiliated to the prime minister and the director the directorate of the religious affairs appoint uh, religious personages in mosques. Uh, they prepare the set texts so that those are delivered in the mosques on Fridays. The uh, goal is uh, to have a conception of Islam which would be friendly with modernization. Uh, I have found out uh, that 
rather I read the other day and I had no thought about it. Um, there is this uh, professor, Jehan Tual, uh, who has a book entitled Passive Revolution. What he mentions in passing is very important. He has found out that in this district, uh, in Istanbul, in the center of Istanbul, which had been very Islamist, there have been some changes taking place, taking place in recent decades. And the, uh, uh, these Islamists are turning into pious. And this has been happening because of the Justice and Development Party. And Jehan Tual argues that as a consequence of which, as a consequence of this particular transformation, these Islamists are turning into pious and therefore they start to pay more attention uh, to those texts prepared by the Directorate of Religious Affairs. Now, this is another implication. You see, when we talked about secularism and laicism, these are two different phenomena. Secularism might lead to laicism, and laicism may lead to secularism. Now, in the very last uh, example I've shared with you, it seems to the extent to which you have laicism, you may begin to have more secularism. But if you look at the Turkish experience, I think in Turkey, because of the westernized education, for instance, starting very early in the Republic, and some other, uh, some other developments, uh, the majority of the Turks have become secularism in the sense I have defined secularism, and as a consequence of which they start to support laicism. So it is, this is not, of course, what your, uh, what your question uh, made to think about these things. So we should distinctly separate laicism and secularism, and uh, we should keep in mind that uh, under certain circumstances, secularism, in fact, may lead to laicism, and on other uh, occasions, uh, laicism would facilitate uh, you know, the adoption of secularism on the part of, uh, on the part of some Muslims. I don't know if in the process I have uh, discussed, I have uh, answered your question. Thank you. Um, Professor, you mentioned earlier sort of a rough taxonomy of religious political persuasion, and I'm wondering to what extent, um, or I'm, I guess I'm just in general wondering the socioeconomic aspects of this. As you said before, in 1920, it sounds as though it did, as it did elsewhere in the region, take on a rather socioeconomic form where you have this sort of civilized elite adopting a very Western aesthetic, whereas traditional forms of dress became associated with ignorance, poverty. Um, and I'm wondering if that's the case today, or and, and or if that's how it's perceived and imagined today. But as I have pointed out, uh, covering is not approved by uh, by a certain portion of secularists uh, in Turkey, uh, it is considered, a, you know, as a as a sign of tradition, as a sign of backwardness, and and, and all the rest of it. So, uh, what happens as a consequence is that the uh, those secularists uh, do not attribute. Legitimacy. This is also very important to the legitimacy of the government. 
Donald Atzulut, legitimacy to a Recep Tayyip Erdogan, for instance, as, as Prime Minister. Uh, uh, I mean, it is also just one dimensional thought, you see. It, it is just the developing and nothing else. So what's happening in Turkey is that the uh, Justice and Development Party from 2002 to, to, to the present has been quite successful when it comes to economy, when it comes to uh, Turkey standing uh, in the world, when Turkey is now considered as a regional power with some aspirations for becoming a global power. Uh, but the, uh, the, the secularists that I have uh, I've been referring to are not paying any, any attention to any of these. Uh, No, they are still of the opinion that uh, these people are not civilized, these people are not modernized, these people are not progressives. But of course, it, it is very difficult to figure out why they are not paying any attention to uh, some of the successes uh, of Turkey under Justice and Development Party government, which is also acknowledged not only by Turks but uh, by others. So uh, this uh, this focus you see on Etzikar, and that's of course a symbol. Now you know we are going to have local elections. <coughs> We are going to have uh, national elections. There will be the election of uh, our president, a new president. But the, uh, the secularists I have in mind and the political party or parties that represent them are not coming up with new programs are not criticizing economic, social, economic problems and therefore coming up with alternative uh, programs. Uh, there has begun this shouting game between Prime Minister and the uh, head of the uh, uh, main opposition party. I mean, if you read newspapers, they start calling each other names uh, and nothing else. And Turkish media also has been divided, even on empirical, empirical issues, you see. One newspaper writes, uh, this was what happened yesterday, other newspaper either does not pay any attention or says exactly the opposite. So it has, it has become a very difficult task to be uh, a professor of political science. And you know, I'm, I'm supposed to uh, uh, follow up what's going on. But I, I'm just tired of see. And in any case, I've been so focused on, on, on this book of you know, the arguments I want to develop here that I'm not really paying all that attention because I'm reading the same thing every day. Sometimes I ask my students, which newspapers do you read and why? And they're at a loss then, you know, when they cannot come up with any uh, you know, persuasive answer. Good. Then I would ask why. And they have no answer to, to that 
second part of the question, and, and, I, and, and I tell them, well, I, I, I make my question more specific. Which columnists do you read? I ask my students. Uh, and then I have to explain to them which columnists I'm reading and why. And I ask them, you know, I look at the title of the column. If I, if I can guess what the columnist is going to say, I don't read it. <laughs> and most of the time you can guess. There are very few columnists in Turkey that uh, <clears throat> may say something different than what I have guessed. Uh, and then, of course, uh, not here. You will be very good. You are not asking very specific questions. You are asking more general questions uh, with which I can deal uh, relatively easily. But sometimes, you know, uh, you are called to you know, take part in a panel on TV, for instance. You see. We were talking about this uh, last night at dinner. Uh, can I ask you very specific questions? I don't know. I don't know the answer to those questions. There is this particular saying, perhaps, uh, very well tells uh, what happens to a professor when he is on a panel with some journalists. The saying goes as follows. Journalists are those people who know less and less about more and more until they know nothing about everything. The professor is exactly the opposite. You say. The professor is someone who knows more and more about less and less until he knows everything about nothing. <laughs> so that, that's why I'm very pleased that you're asking questions that I know a little bit about. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, please. I have a phrase this. At the, so at the beginning of your presentation, um, it, you were sort of describing the way that people responded to survey questions. You know, um, uh, would you favor the introduction of polygyny? Would you favor enforcement of Sharia, etc.? Um, and it strikes me that that those kinds of questions, in a way, are also, and I'm speaking of, of kind of ideal normative worldview, but that, that those, those kinds of survey questions are, in a way, an ideal normative way of, con of defining who's a religious person, uh, in the sense that a lot of times people's lived experience of their religiosity is, is not necessarily in line with sort of textbook theology, if I can put it that way. Um, so that I, I wonder if, if, if we can think about some of the polarization that's taking place in Turkish life, or American life for that matter, um, is, is talked about in terms of religion, but, but actually, I mean, in other words, people articulate their differences in, in terms of religion, but a lot of it is... is beyond the theological, it's more a cultural attitude towards life. And um, uh, in how one would begin even to measure what degree of, of, of tension there is along that spectrum. Yes, uh, I mean, in Turkey, another distinction we should make is between the religious oriented and the conservative people. In Turkey, again, we don't make that distinction. You know, if we say conservative, Muhafazakar in Turkish. Uh, several people you know, come to the conclusion that we are talking about religion. Now, the uh, uh, Justice and Development Party, as I pointed out, uh, considers itself as a, uh, a conservative, democratic political party. And Justice and Development Party this is uh, another thing I would like to point out concerning that political party. And if you have already 
had not arrived at the conclusion, but now you will that, that, that the, I am a great supporter of justice and development. What they do is uh, they have a balanced approach to so many issues, including conservatism, including religion, including democracy, uh, including change, including globalization. If you read the uh, party programs of s- several political parties, uh, they usually approach these <coughs> phenomena for, from, from different perspectives, I mean, for, from one perspective. But when it comes to justice and development party, it, it, it is very, very interesting that they approach these issues in a very balanced way balanced manner. For instance, on state and religion relationship, this is what you read in their program. They write, freedom of conscience is of utmost importance. This freedom also involves the freedom of living one's religion in accordance with one's belief. The state should not be able to impose its own dogma upon society. The state should be equally distant to all religions and thoughts, making possible their peaceful coexistence. Then they continue. The state too should be freed from the clutches of any kind of dogma. Forming a political party in the name of religion, or to even give such an image, is the greatest harm one can render to religion. Religion is a common belief system. Nobody has a right to use it for partisan purposes and thus give rise to divisions in society and politics. And nobody has a right to try to make others more pious. Concerning traditions and conservatism, uh, in politics one might take one's cues from traditional values one should not, however, transform the latter into an ideology. Reflection and politics of one's personal views and feelings based on religion is only to be expected. However, it should not clash with laicism. And turning to uh, tradition, order, and freedom, let me just also read this. Freedom and order are not phenomena that negate each other. In fact, one cannot have one without the other. Yet the freedom to tinker with customs, traditions, norms of morality, and religious life cannot be approved. On the other hand, society is not individuals coping, but it's credible. Such institutions as the family, school, civil society organizations enable the individual to defend his or her rights and freedoms against the state. Have I answered your question? Hmm. I, I guess, I'm, uh, in other words, so if you if answered my question in the sense that that's the parties, uh, uh, that's the AKP's position on that. But what I mean to say is, we, I observe both in um, Turkish life and oddly in American life too, I mean I often am struck by parallels between the two, that um, we, we, it's something that you also were, were mentioning in your presentation, that um, cultural wars or values discourse uh, takes the place in some sense of discussion of actual you know, material and empirical uh, uh, problems. We spend a lot of time talking about traditional family values and not a lot of time talking about, you know, the collapse of the industrial infrastructure, uh, for instance. And, uh, um, and uh, I just, so there's kind of two things there. One thing is that instead of thinking about the cultural debate itself as one between religious and non-religious, what else is really at stake in that cultural debate? Uh, uh, besides religion or in addition to religion. And then also 
why have cultural debates taken the place of debates about the actual material conditions or political conditions of our societies? I mean, those are, I mean, I, I don't actually expect anybody to have an answer to that. I'm just interested in your thoughts. Um, since I have no Das ist eine Developmentfrage. Uh, would like to bring back uh, some uh, uh, cultural values. We may call them cultural values from the Ottoman Empire. For instance, they place a great emphasis on the family. Family, of course, played a very significant role in the Ottoman Empire. You know, we were at the center and then the society, but we did not have some civil society organizations, this or that. Uh, but when you talked about the periphery, you really talked about the family and the uh, neighborhood. In the Ottoman Empire, you did not have an aristocracy. You did not have uh, a bourgeoisie. Now, as we are all aware of the fact that bourgeoisie, the aristocracy, have been the carriers of some values, and then those values have been internalized by a great number of people in society. You know, for aristocracy, honor is very important. For the bourgeoisie, among other things, punctuality is very important. You know, you have to produce and get them to a certain place on time. Now, we did not have those. We had Kemalism, but Kemalism has not been a roadmap on, you know, in daily life. So we were left with, with religion. And some educated reading, Western philosophers, etc. For RKP, uh, and in fact the uh, its predecessors, it was very important, they thought, that uh, people should derive certain virtues, uh, certain roadmaps from, from Islam, so that, uh, and, and Turkey would benefit from it. For instance, uh, hard work is very much emphasized in Islam and in other monotheistic religions. Education is very much emphasized in Islam. There is a saying, if, if the education is China, go and, go and get it, you see. Hard work, uh, <coughs> justice is very important. So the justice and development. And so, for instance, from time to time, Recep Tayyip Erdogan making some statements which is not in the best diplomatic practice, where he comes out and speaks his mind when it comes to Israel Palestine issue or Turkey Israel relations, for instance. The very first uh, religious oriented political party was set up in 1970. It was the National Order Party. In fact, the leader of the, the then Nakshi Bandi, the then leader of the Nakshi Bandi religious order, came up with this idea that in Turkey one should have a religious oriented political party. Because that political party would place emphasis on such virtues that Islam teaches, as a consequence of which, in fact, the Turkish economy would 
develop. As a consequence of which, in fact, we would have uh, we would do a very good political crisis that Turkey has been facing all the time. And, as a consequence, the state also would leave us alone. Of course, just as the development party is no uh, nationalist order party, because at the time, uh, the religious oriented political parties in Turkey thought there was a basic incompatibility between religion and secularism. But as time went by, the religious oriented political parties came to the conclusion that religion should not walk its nose into state affairs and the state should not interfere in religious affairs. And of course, this is what the Justice and Development Party also thinks. But for that, uh, for instance, communalized piety is, is another important matter that the Justice and Development Party emphasizes, which is against the uh, cameras, because the cameras wanted to, you know, the uh, place for religion was the individual conscience. But now communalized uh, piety is another thing that the Justice and Development Party is for. Therefore, uh, therefore uh, families, because in their opinion, families are the carriers of Islam, but not, you know, political Islam, but individualized uh, uh, Islam. You mentioned uh, the question, the, uh, the, the fact of mimicry several times in your talk, and I wanted to ask questions about that, well, see if I'm understanding this right. Because it seems that um, the mimicry of the West <coughs> that has taken place, at the, and it seems that the part of the, at least in part, the weaknesses or uh, the problems of secularism is predicated on that mode of mimicry. And, and, and yet at the same time, this kind of mimicry, the kind of things that we're talking about, it never takes place in, as it were, uh, in, uh, a kind of an even or a, a open playing field, but rather under duress. Right? I'm thinking particularly in relation to uh, Japan. Uh, I mean, I should say that I don't really um, study Japan as a profession. That's not my field, but I just I have no bit about it by growing up. Um, because that, too, was always... Um, uh, criticized for the sort of mechanical mimicry. And particularly, it's not earlier than the case of Turkey, perhaps, but by the end of the 19th century, I've seen some of the writings by Americans and others that this is a nation of, uh, of the, the wholesale um, mimics. And in fact, that their great or seemingly uh, great success was that this is essentially a nation of uh, spirit possession. I mean, basically, the Western spirit has possessed them, and that this is a, their national character, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, but obviously, all that mimicry really takes place under a, a tremendous duress. I mean, in other words, when you see a certain kind of pow um, powerful weapon of whatever is directed at you, you need to come up with something that counteracts it very quickly. And, uh, and I think that's where, in, in the case of Japan, they looked over Germany or Prussia, looking at the success of that nation within the course of the 19th century, and they never looked back. Right? And they become exactly, they do the military that way, they do the bureaucracy that way, and they build industry that way. And it, at that time, they, it, it seems like uh, why, for example, Christi uh, Christianity didn't make, it, didn't make its inroad there. 
because it was not because of some native resistance to that foreign religion, but because they realized that the most powerful nation, or what they thought as the most powerful nation, was utilizing not Christianity. In fact, Christianity was being put down. It is Hegel and Kant on one hand, and Spencer and Darwin that they need to imitate. Uh, so this, this seemed to be a you know, fairly well-documentable choices uh, that they made. So therefore, they made secularism as a choice, but uh, under the duress. I take it that it is obviously very much a similar kind of power dynamics that was going on in the last day of the Ottoman Empire. I'm thinking particularly of that marvelous and tremendous uh, chandelier in Dolmabace, which seems like this is a kind of a last Ottoman answer to <laughs> the West by totally overpowering it. <laughs> right? Coming up with only with this enormous thing. Um, so so that I, I mean I, I'm so impressed by that image of it. And that that's what made me think of it. But I wondered if you had you know, some more to say about this kind of the duress aspect of it and what it produces. Uh, my comments on Japan. <laughs> Grows up on this chapter, ah. Japan, environmental and foreign contributions uh, in this edited volume, Political Modernization in Japan and Turkey, ah. edited by Robert E. Rose and Dan Kodrasso, published Princeton University Press in 1964. The uh, author is Robert A. I don't know how to write. Carapino. So in this in this chapter, uh, this Carapino wrote the following: the process of modernization is vastly more complex than the mere copying of a textile machine or the employment of a foreign technician. <coughs> in the political field, particularly. <coughs> The mechanical borrowing of foreign institutions and procedures nearly always ended in failure. In the final analysis, Japanese modernizers in the political field learn by their own experiences through a process of trial and error. Then they made many mistakes, but it was the willingness to experiment, the essential pragmatism characterizing the leadership that gave the political modernization of Japan its most progressive qualities, especially in the Meiji era. So this was, you see, I, I was trying to make a comparison between the Turkish case and the Japanese case. So in your case, it was selective modernization. Uh, in, in the case of Turkey, uh, it was uh, non-selective modernization, uh, if you like. By the way, when it comes to Christianity and Islam, of course, the basic difference is that in Christianity, this world of someone else, that world of still someone else, but uh, in Islam, uh, at least in classical Islam, no such distinctions were made. So, therefore, uh, taking into account these differences, you see, by taking these differences into account, uh, I have developed the argument I have shared with you this morning. I hate to stop, but we need to have a, a break before our next panelist on Turkey. Thank you so much. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, University of Chicago Divinity School. Thank you.